No longer would black athletes just shut up and play. The action forced America to have some very uncomfortable conversations. Here to discuss it all, we have retired ESPN radio host and sports broadcaster Bill Daughtry. Retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, who's the author of the book, Black and Blue, Volume 2. And Super Bowl champion and sports commentator, Chris Canty. Welcome to all of you. Chris, let's start with you. The ripple effect spread quickly. What do you think will be the end result of all of this? Well, I think that the NBA players, what they had in mind when they decided to shut down the league for a couple of days, is that they wanted to try to bring awareness to the issues, but then be a part of a change agent in what, you know, outlining the steps that needed to be taken in order to facilitate that change. And one of the biggest ones is voter participation. LeBron James started the More Than a Vote campaign earlier this year, and I think that the players got the NBA owners on board with being able to take that to the next step by using all the NBA arenas across the league as polling centers in their respective cities to be able to encourage people to come out and vote and practice proper safety precautions, being able to properly socially distance. So I think that that was a huge step from the player's standpoint. A lot of people ask what was there to be gained by the players not playing those couple of days. That is something that is, is underappreciated in terms of the outcomes that the players were able to realize as a result of leveraging their athletic talents. Sergeant Dorsey and Bill weigh in on this. Well, I think it was important to get us talking. And listen, we've been doing a lot of talking for many, many years, right? And I'm a little disillusioned, if you will, and not, not really hopeful that much is going to change. We've had this conversation nonstop since 2014 with the killing of Eric Garner and then Mike Brown and Tamir Rice and everything that's followed. And so now we have yet again, with each instance, it seems like it can't get any worse. Having an officer sit on a black man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, having us watch him die in our presence, so to speak, was awful. And I thought it could not get worse. And now here we have a police officer and a department who's trying to minimize and mitigate unnecessary deadly force in the use of seven shots in the back of Jacob Blake. It was over the top. There were other alternatives and options that the officers had available, but they've learned through non-accountability that if you shoot a black man, woman, or child, it's okay. Yeah. The other day I was listening to Chris on the radio talking about how it, you know, everybody talks about this is not acceptable. And I felt his rage boil over when he said, if it's unacceptable, why do we keep talking about it? When do we do something about it? And that's why I was particularly proud of what the NBA players, the WNBA players did last week after uh, Jacob Blake was shot in the back. They were slow to move. There was no action, no, no positive result that anyone could see. And so these athletes exercised their right is what they are. And I'm, I don't mean athletes. I don't mean millionaires. I mean, they're citizens of this country. What happened to Jacob Blake, what happened to George Floyd, what happened to Breonna Taylor could happen to any of us. And they simply said, enough. The, 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 the train is going to stop right here because we're stopping it. And that George Hill and the Milwaukee Bucks did what they did and came out with their statement. And what I particularly liked about the statement was athletes are always expected to perform to this nth level to this degree that nobody can really ever realistically perform at. Well, George Hill passed that on to the lawmakers in Wisconsin. He said, let me see you perform as you want to see us perform whenever we're on the court. Now, there's been pushback from the administration on all of this. Um, Jared Kushner said that uh, it's nice that athletes should be able to, uh, they have enough money that they can take a day off, a kind of downplaying and, and in fact belittling exactly what was going on there. Um, do you think that that has had a, a real negative impact as far as how this is viewed by people across the country? Or do you think that's just chatter off to the side that's uh, driven by an agenda? Well, I think it's driven by an agenda and it's politically motivated, but the reality is that the NBA players decided that they were gonna step away from something that they love to do, something that most of them have done their entire lives competing in the playoffs at the highest level of the sport. They took two days away from that to prioritize being able to make a difference in what we're seeing in the way of police brutality and excessive force used by law enforcement. Because Sergeant Dorsey made a point. 
she said that the police established the standard for black lives. And that's essentially where we're at right now. People are seeing that it's viewed as lesser than than white counterparts. And something about that has to change. And the NBA athletes understand their platform and they also recognize that they're ambassadors for an entire community that hasn't been seen or heard since the inception of this country. Sergeant Dorsey, what do you think should happen in Kenosha as far as the officer is concerned? Well, certainly I think the officer, uh, certainly the one that fired the seven shot should be dealt with. And I, I would imagine we'll find out later that this probably isn't the first time that he's acted in a way that was egregious and outrageous. Listen, we only learn about these officers when it makes national news. And once it makes national news, we find out as in the case of Derek Chauvin, who had been involved in 18 personnel complaints, that this is just how they get down. And so when you have a police department who is willing to shelter, coddle, and explain away um, abuses of policy, abuses of authority, then the officer lives to offend again. And so charging him would be a good first step, but then listen, there's a long road to hoe after that. They've Mm -hmm. got to be prosecuted, and if prosecuted, then they need to um, be uh, given a sentence that is commiserate with the crime. And so these are baby steps and we're a long way from uh, really justice for this family. And when I say justice, I mean having the officer be held personally accountable. Yeah, it, it's, it's always kind of a thing that, that I have seen here in New York City covering the news for many years where you just cover incident after like this after incident. And you wonder how can this all be happening and how can so many officers walk at the end of the day by just basically saying, hey, I, I felt my life was threatened. Well, you know, great deference is given to what a police officer says. And we see that juries have a difficult time finding against an officer because they say, well, the job is tough and it's true it is. And, you know, the person should have complied. Maybe they should have. All of that is inherent to police work. We know when we sign on to be a police officer that folks are not going to cooperate. Who wants to go to jail? Nobody. We know that people run from us. You get ready to get some exercise. You don't get to shoot them in the back like Walter Scott was. And so while they try to minimize and mitigate this bad behavior and they talk about doing things not only locally but nationally that really won't change a patrol officer day to day and how they conduct themselves in the field, police chiefs around these 18,000 police departments could stop this stuff tomorrow if they really had an appetite to do that. Do you think that the officer on the street, the rank and file actually hears and appreciates what uh, black athletes are doing right now? Um, I think there's a segment that do, um, but then there's, a, there's that group that, you know, and I know this to be true because I worked with them and I know when we're in in-service training and we're being taught, you know, bias um, type courses or sensitivity or cultural awareness, you have a certain segment that are going to sit in the back of the room and they're going to suck mm-hmm. their teeth and roll their eyes and they're going to wait for it to be over so they can hurry up and get back out in the field and kick ass and take names because that's mm-hmm. what they do. It's the culture. And when any police chief gets in front of a bank of camera and clutches their pearls and acts surprised, they're being intellectually dishonest because understand this, every police chief, sheriff, and commissioner was once a police police officer or deputy sheriff. And so this stuff has been going on ad infinitum. And that's why we continue to have this discussions because I believe there's really no appetite for police chief to hold an errant officer accountable. I believe that their loyalties are to the entity. In most Mm -hmm. instances, they understand that a civil lawsuit is coming. And so they are trying to protect that entity and in so doing, protect the officer. Bill, I want to go back to the players just a bit. Um, When We talked some time ago, we talked about Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. uh, He had basically been banned from football, blacklisted. And you said he would never play again. What did you make of the NFL's flip on all of this? I made the NFL's flip, especially when people started demanding that he get a roster spot somewhere. I said, no, 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 no. He's past the playing stage. He needs to be in the NFL front office dealing with these kinds of relationships, dealing with these social situations, dealing with these po- the protests that players have felt comfortable and rightly so with demonstrating now. Uh, you know, there's no surprise in any of this. Chris? No, I think Bill is absolutely right. The NFL, in a lot of instances, does what fits their agenda in that particular moment. And I think that they recognize that the needle had moved in the wake of what happened with George Floyd in the fight for equality. 
after people saw that optic of Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for over eight minutes, people were started to ask the questions, why is this happening? How can this be so blatantly obvious and that we've not paid attention to it? And I think the NFL recognized that the position and the opinion of folks changed about Colin Kaepernick's protest back in 2016. They wanted to frame it as it was disrespectful to the military when it was never about the military. And I think folks started to recognize that when they actually saw how bad it was and how George Floyd was treated in that moment. So I think the NFL realized that things changed. And then the video that the NFL players put out, Pat Mahomes and Odell Beckham Jr. and Michael Thomas and others that were featured on it, asking the NFL to acknowledge what is going on in the fight for equality, asking the NFL to recognize their wrongs and not listening to its players previously. I think that has put a lot of pressure on the NFL to move in the opposite direction uh, when you compare it to where they were at in 2016. So uh, I think this, this, this age of athlete is recognizing their agency and trying to use that in the fight for equality. And that's why you have to applaud them because they're putting a lot on the line. A lot of these guys mm-hmm. are in the primes of their athletic careers, and that means they're in the primes of their earning potential, and they're willing to compromise that or sacrifice that in order to take a stand against something that we all recognize is wrong. Okay, great. Well, this is all something that is, uh, I think it's going to be continuing to grow in the weeks and months and years ahead. And we're going to keep an eye on it to see what change takes place. I want to thank our guests, retired ESPN radio host and sports broadcaster, Bill Daughtry, retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, and Super Bowl champion and sports commentator, Chris Canty. Thank you to all of you. Well, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll examine the historical nomination of Kamala Harris as the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket. But we would be remiss if while talking about sports and racism, we didn't mention Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball and his civil rights work, and the death of the actor who portrayed him so well in the movie 42, Chadwick Boseman. It was Boseman's breakout role continue to have major success playing historical figures like James Brown and Get On Up and Thurgood Marshall and Marshall, all before achieving international fame, playing the lead role in the box office smash hit, Black Panther. Our condolences to his family and friends. We remember and appreciate Chadwick Boseman. 